John Wilkes Booth, America's most notorious assassin. Dead or alive? Now, if you don't know who John Wilkes Booth is, let me give you a little rundown on who he is. John Wilkes Booth was an American actor who came from a family of actors. Booth's parents were noted British Shakespearean actors Junius Brutus Booth and Mary Ann Holmes. Booth was the ninth of ten children who all became actors, so obviously he was destined to become an actor. But when the Civil War broke out, Booth became outspoken for his admiration for the South's succession from the North, probably calling it quote-unquote heroic. This upset, this I mean, this really upset local communities. Uh, they really wanted him banned from the stage for making what they called treasonable statements. On April 14, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln was attending a play at Ford's Theater where Booth was performing. That evening, at around 10 p.m., Booth slipped into the presidential box. Booth was about to commit the most unpardonable of all crimes. He was about to kill one of the greatest, live, one of the greatest presidents of all time, President Abraham Lincoln. As the play progressed, Booth slowly moved towards Lincoln, pulled out a Derringer revolver. Like, it was, if you want to know what a Derringer revolver looks like, imagine, like, a pistol, but, like, the size of your palm. Pulls that out of his jacket, slowly creeps towards Lincoln, points at the back of his head, and shoots the president. Booth then jumped from the presidential box to the stage, hurried to the stage exit, got on his horse, and sped off into the April night. Booth would then lay in hiding in the Maryland woods, waiting for an opportunity to cross the Potomac River where he thought he would be safe in southern territory. I mean, come on. You, you know the war is over. The South loses. At this point, the North had basically taken over the South. There was really no Southern government anymore. I mean, it was all controlled by the North. They had Union soldiers in every Southern state. I mean, and then this guy kills the president. You would, you would know, this, these Union soldiers would know that he's coming. Especially when there's a $100,000 bounty reward on whoever brought in or killed um, President Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. You would know, people would know what, who he is. He would then arrive on, at the Garrett Tobacco Farm on April 25th, but before dawn on April 26th, the Union soldiers caught up with him at the Garrett Barn, where he was hiding. His accomplice, David Harold, surrenders, but Booth refuses, saying, I prefer to come out and fight. Why? You know you're going to die either way. You might as well just go out and surrender. They got you surrounded. You're going to die anyways. By this time, now they've lit the barn on fire. The barn is on fire. He has nowhere to go. He is a trapped rat. Sergeant Boston Corbett finds an opening in the barn. Points his rifle right at Booth. Gets a clear shot and fires on the fugitive assassin, killing him dead. The end, right? You would think so. I mean, this is it. The president's killer's dead. The heroes won the day. Woohoo! Hooray! Heroes won the day. I don't think so. Let's look at the evidence. If Booth is dead, that should be the end of the story. The end. The bad guy is dead. John Wilkes Booth, they don't have to worry about it. They can sleep peacefully at night. But when we go back to the barn, 
David Harold, Booth's accomplice, admitted that the man in the barn he was with was not Booth at all, but instead the farm overseer whose name was Rudy. I did actually look this up. There was a farm overseer at the Garrett Tobacco Barn. At the Garrett Tobacco Farm, his name was Rudy. More on him later. But this is it. Booth has gotten away. Booth is free. He can go anywhere he wants now. Right? But instead of trying to, I don't know, leave the country, he goes down to Granbury, Texas, where he thought he could hide out the rest of his life. He falls ill, makes a deathbed confession that he was John Wilkes Booth. But then he recovers, flees for Enid, Oklahoma, where he commits suicide in 1903 under the alias of David E. George. More on that coming up real soon. Now back to the body that was pulled out of the barn. Booth's body was covered with a blanket tied to the side of an old farm wagon for the trip back to Washington, D.C. There his corpse is taken uh, upon the USS Montauk for an autopsy and identification. The body identified there is Booth by more than, is identified as more than, by 10 people as Booth. The identifying features used to make sure that the man that was killed was Booth was a tattoo on his left hand with the initials JWB and a distinct scar on the back of his neck. However, the investigation was extremely sloppy. I will dive in. The doctor who identified Booth was his own personal doctor let me i let me repeat myself it was his own personal doctor that right there is an immediate red flag why oh why would you bring in his own personal doctor to identify a man that you think is john wilkes booth Interesting enough, though, the doctor actually said that the man on the table was not Booth How? because the man that they thought was Booth had chestnut brown hair and no facial hair. But everybody who had known Booth knew that Booth had jet black hair and a prominent mustache. I can hear you saying right now, well, I mean, that could be easily fixed. When he was at Mud's house, he could have easily dyed his hair and shaved off his mustache. They had those tools back then. Okay. Okay. Fair argument. But answer this question for me. When did Booth have time to do this? He's a fugitive assassin. There's Union soldiers following him as they as he was traveling to Mud's. Everybody knows where he's heading. So when did he have time? Everybody knows he's trying to get to the to the southern territory. So as soon as he gets to Muds, he has only enough time to heal his wounds, fix his leg, and then he's gone again. He's not staying anywhere longer than as long as needed. He stops at the Surratt Tavern to pick up supplies and guns and whatever he needs to survive. He's there to survive. He's not staying anywhere longer than a few hours and then he's on his way. Bottom line, he has no time to dye his hair and shave off his mustache. Dyeing his hair would have taken way too long, and time is of the essence with Booth in this one. He's killed the president. He's on the run. He has nowhere to go. Now we go back to the body. On the USS Montauk. The autopsy's done. They bury the body very sloppy, really fast, in the old penitentiary in Washington, D.C. after the autopsy. He was later moved to the warehouse of the Washington Arsenal 
in October of 1867, two years after he died. They hid his body from everyone until he sent his body back to Baltimore, Maryland in 1869, four years after Booth died. By this time, his body would have been almost unrecognizable because of decaying. The Maryland Historical Society in 1913 published an account by Baltimore Mayor William Pegram, who had seen Booth's remains when the casket arrived at the Weaver Funeral Home in Baltimore on February 18, 1869 for burial. Now tell me, how can they identify a body that has been dead for over four years? It's not possible. The body would be in decay at this point. You're not identifying this body as the fugitive assassin as John Willis Booth, plain and simple. And here's the kicker. Here's the real kicker. William Pegram had known Booth when Booth was younger. He knew this man personally. So, of course, he's going to sign a document, a sworn statement that, yes, we have the body of John Wilkes Booth. No, you don't. You have the farm overseer. You don't have Booth. Booth is probably somewhere near Arkansas or Kansas. He's not there. He's not even in Virginia anymore. He's nowhere near Washington, D.C. at this point. He got out of there. But that's still the point. William Pegram, a man who knew Booth personally, said, yes, we have the body of John Wilkes Booth. Yes, he's here. I can identify him myself. I knew, him when he, I knew him when he was young. Yes, this is Booth. How? The body is dead. It's been dead for over four years. The body's in decay. How can you identify a man who's been in decay for over four years as the fugitive assassin John Wilkes Booth? But that's not all. Once again, I mean, how can you... There were others who positively identified his body as Booth at the funeral home. Booth's mother... His brother, his sister, along with his dentist, and other Baltimore acquaintances. These people were not trained professionals. These people knew him personally. So, of course, you're going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, it's Booth with the chestnut brown hair and the no mustache. Yeah, it's him. Yeah. No, it's not him. You're identifying a body of somebody else as your sibling or your son or your patient you're not gonna identify somebody correctly as booth the identif this identifying thing is going to come in later on when i talk about billy the kid and others but you'll find that out later but still how can you positively identify a man four years after he died it's not happening you're not identifying him it's not possible Now that's over. Now we'll talk about his escape. What he did. The names he went under. People who knew him. People who got to meet him. Stuff like that. There are two different scenarios that I will discuss. As what may have happened to John Wilkes Booth. The first comes from the 1998 book. The Curse of Cain. The Untold Story of John Wilkes Booth which contends that Booth had escaped and found refuge in Japan and returned to the United States later on. Now, immediately, there's a problem with this. There's immediately a problem. How can Booth, if this is true, how that Booth left the country, he would have to change his looks. Otherwise, people around the ports would have recognized him, and then he's in trouble. Because people recognize him. He's going to. Somebody's going to tell the police. That this man killed President Lincoln. He has to change his looks. Otherwise this. Otherwise this is not going to work. He's not going to be able to leave for Japan. But you never know. 
he could have. He could have, after he left the Garrett farm, he could have found somewhere to hide, change his looks, make himself a different, shave off the notorious mustache, t dye his hair a different color, change his looks completely. It's possible. But not likely. But possible. But most theories indicate that Booth still ended up in Granbury, Texas around 1873. He was there in 1873, which means if he did go to Japan, he wasn't there much. He wasn't there long. He probably went there for a year or so, let things die down, you know, kind of let things blow over, wait for them to bury him. As far as he knows, he doesn't know they're not gonna they're gonna hold his body for four years before sending it back to Maryland. They don't know that. All he, all he knows is he's a free man. The second scenario is that Booth never goes to Japan, but instead, after he escaped the barn, he fled Virginia altogether and made his way through the South all the way to Texas to the small town of Granbury. Here is where Booth changes his name. From John Wilkes Booth to John St. Helen. You gotta hide. You gotta change your name. You cannot go by John Wilkes Booth anymore. You are a... If you go by that name, somebody's gonna notice. Nobody will believe you, but some people will not notice because they know at this point you're dead. So either way, I mean... But he changed his name anyways to make it seem inconspicuous. Now let's talk about John St. Helen. A man by the name of Phineas, Phineas L. Bates, who was a lawyer. According to his book, The Escape and Suicide of John Wilkes Booth, in 1873, Bates met a man by the name of John St. Helen, a liquor and tobacco merchant in Granbury. According to Bates, the man had a particular tendency toward the theatrical and could recite Shakespeare from memory. Bates and St. Helen cultivated a friendship for, that lasted over five years. In 1878, St. Helen became ill and unfortunately admitted this. Quote, I am dying. My name is John Wilkes Booth, and I am the assassin of President Lincoln. Get the picture of myself from underneath the pillow. I leave it with you for my future identification. Notify my brother, my brother Edwin Booth of New York City. He knew who Booth's brother was. Why? And he knew exactly where you could find his brother in New York City. Why would you admit this to someone who, for all you know, could have been a police officer? You don't know. So as soon as you become well again, you're going to, you know, wind up getting yourself into a lot of trouble. Because now you just admitted that you're John Wilkes Booth. Now, what do you do at this point? What do you do? You become, now you become well again. And then this man wants you to tell more about what you know. And then you admit that you know that the leader of the conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln was Vice President Andrew Johnson. Not likely. Could be. Not likely. The identity of the man mortally wounded in the Garrett Tobacco Barn by Boston Corbett was the plantation overseer by the name of Rudy. How would you know this unless you were John Wilkes Booth? How? How would you know this? You, won't, you don't even know who is at the Garrett Tobacco Farm. You don't even know who works there. Yet you know you're Johnson Hunt and you know the name of the of farm overseer whose name was Rudy. St. Helen asked Rudy to fetch, or sorry, Booth asked Rudy to fetch his papers, which had fallen out of his pocket. Rudy was able to retrieve Booth's papers, and while still in possession of them, Rudy was mortally wounded in Garrett's barn by Sergeant Boston Corbett, thus leading his captors to believe he was Booth. He had evidence. 
Moody had evidence that made everybody believe that he was Booth. He had Booth's papers that had his name on him. So, of course, you're going to get confused. Oh, wait. What, what's this? Oh, these papers. Oh, they say John Wilkes Booth. We must have got John Wilkes Booth, guys. Oh, wait. He has chestnut brown hair. Uh, just cover his body with a blanket and we'll take it back to Washington, D.C. on the side of that wagon. Nobody will know. I mean, yeah. Now, I mean, how? why would you admit this to somebody who is going to write it in a book? And then after this confession, John St. Helens, or Booth as we know him now, flees Granbury, Texas for Eden, Oklahoma. This, right around here, is where I believe John Wilkes Booth changed his name to David E. George. Now let's look at that name. David E. George. David and George were the names of the accomplices of Booth during the assassination of President Lincoln and the assassination of the Secretary of State, I think it was. If I remember right, it was the Secretary of State. But David E. George was a house painter who also had a hobby for quoting Shakespeare. This man knew Shakespeare. So did John St. Helens. He committed, this man, David E. George, committed suicide by ingesting poison on January 13th, 1903, while staying at room number four at the Grand Avenue Hotel in Eden, Oklahoma, which is now a furniture store. You can look it up. It's a furniture store now in Enid. Tenants that night complained of hearing groans and moans in George's locked room. When they finally got the door open, they found him dead in his room at 11 a.m. that morning. Acting coroner Joe S. Jacobs assembled the coroner's jury, jury, which included Mayor Charles O. Wood, and determined that George had died of alcohol and poison-induced heart failure. Methodist Episcopal minister Reverend Enoch Covert Harper came to view the body and relayed a story to William H. Ryan, who I think was a reporter, Oh no! Sorry, he was the embalmer. Who was the? He was the one who was embalming the body of David E. George. That in 1900, his wife, to be at the time Mrs. Jessie May Coon, was staying in El Reno, Oklahoma, where she met this man by the name of David E. George, who had reportedly confessed to Mrs. Coon that he was the fugitive assassin John Wilkes Booth. Why? Why would you tell somebody you don't even know that you are the fugitive assassin unless you were the fugitive assassin and you were trying to tell your story or something? But of course, Mrs. Coon dismayed the confessions as the product of some kind of drug-induced delirium. George was also quoted as saying, and I quote, I killed the best man that ever lived. Why would you admit that you killed somebody? Even if you didn't kill a person. Why would you admit that you killed somebody in general? You don't see O.J. Simpson going out and saying, I admit it. I am the one who killed my wife and Goldman. Why? Why would you say, even if you didn't, like I said, if you didn't kill a person, why would you say you killed somebody? Why? It doesn't matter who you are. You're not going to tell somebody you killed somebody if you didn't do it. That's why OJ is sticking to what he did. He didn't kill the. He didn't kill Simpson. He didn't kill Goldman. And he's sticking to his story, just like John Wilkes Booth should have. But no, he went and admitted he was John Wilkes Booth. Which makes it very interesting on why he would say that. He's at the end of his life. So he's going to admit to everybody. He's John Wilkes Booth. He figured the government's not going to do anything to him at this point. The statute of limitations has probably passed at this point. So he thought. So he's going to tell everyone he's John Wilkes Booth. But on January 23rd, 1903, Venice L. Bates came to identify the body in Oklahoma and found and 
admitted that this was his old acquaintance of John St. Helen. You would think he would know who John St. Helen is. He is this guy's best friend for five years until John Wilkes Booth, or sorry, John St. Helens, admitted that he was the fugitive assassin and then left. Ultimately, what no one no one else would claim his body, so it fell into the hands of Bates. He called upon James Newton Wilkerson, a Kansas City lawyer, and an expert on John Wilkes Booth, examined the mummy in 1928, comparing its scars of those to John Wilkes Booth, and began touring with the mummified body throughout the Southwest. In 1931, the Chicago Press Club hired six doctors to examine the mummy. Here is their report. And I quote, A scarred right eyebrow that arched upwards, a thickening on the knuckle joint of the right thumb, and a piece of skin missing from the back of the neck. X-rays of the head, hands, and legs showed a thickening of the tissues over the right eyebrow, a thickening in the bones of the right thumb, and a marked thickening of the left fibula at its lower end, indicating an earlier fracture. Ladies and gentlemen, these aren't just people off the streets. These are trained professionals who studied Booth's medical records. They knew about the broken leg. They knew it. That's why there was some... What was it? Where is it? Right here. A thickening of the left fibula at his lower end indicating an earlier fracture because the man had broken his leg or fractured it, whatever it was, when he fell off the stage at Ford's Theater. This man was John Wilkes Booth. But of course, you know, people called this a publicity stunt all because the doctors didn't look at. A couple of facial features. Big deal. So what? They didn't look at a couple of facial features. It's not like the man didn't have a mustache or anything like that. When they when they found David E. George, he had this prominent John Wilkes Booth mustache. He had the same hair color. Why in the world? Why would you argue over the fact that these doctors admit that this man is John Wilkes Booth but yet you're going to criticize it all because they didn't look at a couple facial features oh they didn't look at that facial feature there that can't be Booth sorry this man was John Wilkes Booth people and nobody wanted to admit it because they didn't want to change the history books The last thing I would tell you before I close is this. There was a book that was written called The First True Account of Lincoln's Assassination, which contains a complete confession by Booth many years after the crime, giving in full detail the plans, plot, and intrigue of the conspirators and the treachery of Vice President Andrew Johnson. This book was written by lawyer Finnis L. Bates for the correction of history. That is the end of this talk, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for enjoying me on uh, for joining me on this talk about America's most notorious assassin, John Wilkes Booth, John St. Helen, or David E. George. Either way, I will see you all in the next video.